Welcome to Friend of a Friend from Creative Pinellas, a new conversation series drawing connections between artists, inspirations, friends, and mentors, and showcasing the individuals that together make a creative community. This program is brought to you by Creative Pinellas. Our mission is to facilitate a vibrant, integrative, collaborative, and sustainable Pinellas County arts community and arts and cultural destination. Creative Pinellas is funded in part by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners, Visit St. Pete Clearwater, and the State of Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs. Today's conversation features artists Reed Jenkins and Justin Wager. Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone to the latest episode of Friend of a Friend from Creative Pinellas. My name is Danny, I'm the Curatorial Manager for Creative Pinellas, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the show. If you've joined us in the past, you know kind of the setup of the show. If this is your first time, I'd like to uh, welcome you and also welcome you to check out all of our past episodes. A friend of a friend, uh, the basic theme is, is that uh, last month's host, uh, last month's guest rather, becomes this month's host. And so through that way, we make our journey through the creative community here in Pinellas County, find ways that artists are connected to other artists, and it's really been a lot of fun. In fact, this episode tonight is the ninth episode uh, that we've had. Uh, Justin, tonight is the 10th person that's been on Friend of a Friend, and it's also the last episode of this first season of Friend of a Friend. It's really been a, a lot of fun being on this journey, uh, learning more about the artists in our community, and we're happy that you were able uh, to, jo to join us uh, from that first episode with uh, me and Akiko Kotani down to today's episode featuring uh, Reed and Justin. And so before we start up the second season a friend of a friend coming up in the future, we want to know more from you about what you liked about this series and what we can improve about the series. So, so please stay tuned because we're going to be opening up a survey soon and uh, we'd love to you be able to use that to uh, share with us your thoughts on this series so we can make it even better. Now you can stay tuned for that as well as everything we do at Creative Pinellas uh, by signing up for our email list. That's probably the best way. Uh, you can sign up for that at our Facebook page right on the Facebook page there at the front, you can click the sign up button, or you can visit us at creativepanels.org, check out the contact page, and you'll see the sign up uh, button there as well. Now, as usual, I'd like to introduce tonight's host, which was last episode's guest, which is Reed Jenkins. Uh, Reed is a visual artist working here in Pinellas County, very talented painter, a muralist, tattoo artist, a uh, great artist all around. He was also a past Creative Pinellas emerging artist grantee. And uh, tonight's host, and so uh, with that, Reed, I'd like to uh, hand the show over to you and I'll, I'll step back and see you guys at the end of the show then. All right, see you later, Danny. I'd like to introduce my guest, uh, Justin Wager. How you doing, Justin? Doing yeah. good, good. Good, awesome, man. Well, um, I guess we'll just uh, go ahead and pull up a slide. Danny, can you pull up slide 10 for me? All right, um, Justin. So, I mean, I've personally known you for a minute, but how did yeah. you decide to be an artist? Like of all things. It started uh, going downtown and walking around, just trying to see random stuff on Central Avenue. I heard it was a cool place to go look at some cool stuff. Stumbled into a few galleries and all that, and kind of just went home and bought a sketchbook the next day and figured, see what I could maybe try to figure out myself. Did a lot of just you know, research on different different artists and stuff like that and found what I liked and tried to mimic that in a sense to sort of see if I could get my hands going with some fundamental you know techniques of, of creating artwork. And you know, from there, trying just to meet different people different people downtown and seeing how long I could, I could hang around. So who would, so uh, since you're going downtown and. So yeah, going downtown. Um, so what, what really influenced you downtown? Like as I guess as um, individuals that you met. Yeah. So the first piece that I saw downtown was by Scott Hillis, who obviously is a friend of both of ours. Um, 
it was a piece that he had and I saw that immediately and I saw the illustrative qualities of it and wanted, like I said, to see if I could maybe mimic something like that because I thought it was so cool, you know? Um, I didn't necessarily grow up drawing Superman and, and the different comic book characters and stuff like that. It So trying to learn at an age of like 12, 13 years old, I was trying to mimic the artwork that I saw around me that I thought was really cool, you know? So that was sort of how I developed that, you know? So it was Scott Hillis, Basque was a really big one for me trying to learn how to mimic layers and different techniques and dissect different paintings and, you know, try to find different methods of creating it. So, yeah. Yeah, really, like, I guess, uh, inspiring you more of the technical side or, of approach in order to, like, really yeah, own your skills? Trying to figure out, yeah, trying to figure out process. I think that's that's where a lot of my excitement and curiosity comes comes into play with it. I, I really like, I enjoy figuring out different processes and seeing how someone got to that result and seeing, you know, what I can pull from it to bring a different result, you know, through my work personally nowadays. Okay. Um, Danny, can you pull up slide 16 for me? So you are, I think, kind of unique in the way of, when did you start doing murals? So it was interesting, right? So after, like we talked about going downtown and having that initial spark in my curiosity of creating art, I started going down there every day. And I wanted to, or as and many days as I could, you know, I, I wanted to try to be around it as much as I could. And Derek Donnelly had a gallery called St. Paint. And I would just hang around there. Um, I would hang around there all the time and try to learn how to do anything they were doing, you know, whether it was doing stuff on canvas or painting murals. And at that time they were heavily doing murals. So that's where my, my interest came in there and they gave me a chance to just help out. And so from, I guess the age of 14, I started painting murals with them. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think that's very unique. You, uh, you seem to be one of those artists that really emerged during that mural, um, like, I guess, beginning, and you were only in high right. school, you know? Yeah. I don't know many. Yeah, yeah. high school. That was a fun, yeah. a fun time, right? Because we had my senior year of high school I was at Gibbs High School which you went to as well and so did right. Derek um, and as you know your senior year you create a portfolio of work um, and so I decided to do 12 murals around downtown St. Pete and that was a very challenging thing to do at the time um, and that's where my initial big kickoff started with trying to do as many murals as I could. So from doing those initial 12 that I did around town, I then tried to transition into doing them elsewhere. And this was in Miami. So that was my first trip down to Miami, somewhere other than downtown St. Petersburg, where I tried to do a mural at. And this piece in particular was really fun because this was, uh, this was the guy who I met in the alleyway and I don't remember where I was, but I met him and I was at the time and it kind of started here of trying to take my own references of my own surroundings. Um, and so then I took a picture of him and I told him, I was like, Hey, I'm going to paint you down in Miami on a wall. And he got very excited and, and I never saw him again. And I told him if I saw him, I, you know, I'd show him the painting, but um yeah so that's where that's where this piece kind of originated and where it's at now it's still and it's still down there in miami it's still still riding wow wow that, that's a it's yeah, a rarity so, down there <laughs> yeah definitely yeah 
Yeah. Um, Danny, can you pull up slide 16 for me? I'm, I'm sorry, what number was that? This one is uh, 16, six, 16, yes. This, this is the 16 right here. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, 12 I meant. I'm right. sorry about that. So, so you, you do these telephone poles, right? So yeah. tell me a little bit yeah. about this piece. So. Yeah. yeah, so that piece, um, that was the very first piece that I focused on doing a telephone pole. Um, before this piece, they were mainly all just in my, the backgrounds of a landscape that I was trying to paint or something like that. And this was the very first one where I was like, let me focus on painting a telephone pole. Um, and that and that's where it first started, you know, and that was a little 10 by 10 piece of paper that I have in a frame. And I still have that piece right now. Um, that one's never leaving the house. So that one's fun. That one's a really fun one. So yeah, that that's that piece in particular. Um, I think the the obsession with the telephone poles and the the overlooked landscapes and stuff kind of came from my my first solo show that I did. Um, and that was called Where I Come From and it was at the Morian Arts Center. So I tried to focus heavily on the stuff around St. Petersburg that influenced me as an artist to create artwork and what, what I thought was the cool parts of St. Petersburg that I resonated with personally. So kind of these overlooked areas and whatnot and the, the alleyways or the telephone poles and the, the weird gates that are all over and different stuff. So it was, that was kind of where the telephone pole stemmed from. So just being attracted to uh, what is over often overlooked. Yeah, I guess. yeah, I think, I think it was more or less just what I didn't see other artists focusing on um, or what other representations of St. Petersburg were. You know, when I, when I see different postcards that people put out or if it's, um, you know, a flyer or a pamphlet, it's, you know, the sunny beaches in the, you know, the, the pier and stuff, which is all fantastic. And it is a fun, great looking spot. Um, these other alleyways and different landscapes and stuff that I paint sort of more or less resonate with me more than those things. Okay. Danny, can you pull up slide number six, please? So, so again, like you said, the uh, the over, overlooked little um, areas, but they're also like, they always seem to be especially very intimate, especially with the size, like this mural in particular that's on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this was a very fun piece for me to do. This was, um, this was at a family friend's house and I would, I would be over there all the time over the weekends with my uncle and it was his friends. They had kids. So we initially just, you know, I was friends with, you know, my uncle's friends, kids, and that's, a picture of their backyard so we would always be behind that fence as kids playing around and then all the adults would be on the other side hanging out um and I was over there before I did the show and I took a picture of that and it was just that door and that gate we were always running around in and out of and that was kind of the more intimate side of that piece there um Danny, can you pull up slide number two, please? Now, you definitely um, had this incredible like mark making that that's evolved, but I don't think I really ever see you use color that often. Is there a reason that you don't go for color or? I mean, I really, really love colorful paintings and all that. Like that's, that's what I'm more or less attracted to in 
artwork. Like if I, I find like Michael Vasquez is a great, a great example of someone who has an amazing color palette that I envy and I love. Uh, and, you know, I just personally for me, I've always found working with just those two colors and within the range of those two colors is how help me out to achieve the the look that I want and it's not necessarily just black and white like I'll use a whole scale of blue you know and it'll go all the way from white to whatever shade of blue that I'm trying to use or red or whatever it's just the monochromatic um color scheme is you know what I prefer to work in yeah it definitely gives like this like incredible dramatic effect no matter what you're uh you're painting it it's i don't know it's almost like old uh classic hollywood cinema in a sense right yeah yeah um yeah, fun, man i feel like i can kind of stray away from thinking about what color i'm putting where and i can just focus on the imagery itself a little bit more um and pushing that that contrast super hard helps you know push the image as, as well. Absolutely, Danny, can you pull up uh, slide number nine for me, please? Now, uh, again, yeah. you still continue. Yeah, you seem to still continue doing uh, doing murals. Um, can you yeah. tell me a little bit about this one? Yeah, this one was my second trip to Miami for the same festival. Um, this was at a elementary school, so this one was a very fun environment to work in. Uh, this piece in particular was the first time I tried to do a large scale hand painted mural um, during this process was a lot of a lot of learning and you know I've always used spray paint in the past before this one that at something this scale so trying to gauge how much paint I'm going to need and how much color to mix to apply to a certain scale of an area this one this one was fun, but I achieved, I achieved what I was going for. And this was a factory on the other side of the school. So it was cool that the kids recognized it as they were, you know, going from class to class. There was a few kids who recognized that that was a, a I think it was a cement factory, like on the other side of the street. Now, what kind of, uh, what kind of impact do you feel like those, uh, like you said, it's, it's, um, in a school like what do you feel like that impact is for the students or for the children there i think it's cool for for people to see you know, you know their own communities reflected within that community um the fact that the kids go by that place every day whether they're coming or going from school and seeing someone put it in a different light kind of is, is an interesting thing as a kid to see maybe be, you know, seeing this memorialized scenery in a sense, you know, at such a prominent location and scale inside the school. And maybe it makes them think about just stuff that they walk by every day a little bit differently, you know. Um, you know, you could walk by it and not think twice about it, or you could take a reference photo and paint it on a, you know, two story wall. So. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, and even though you say you like you went to hand hand brush, like I definitely can see the textures within like the brushing, but you can even see like the application of the strokes in the grass, almost like you know you were using with spray with spray paint. Yeah. Simple yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fun. Some of that I believe is spray paint at the end there on the grass part. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this one was a blend of the both, I guess. But for the most part, all of the um, the silos over there and the telephone poles and the and the clouds in the background were all done with a with a big like six inch brush or something like that, and then some rollers. Awesome, um, Danny. Can you pull up slide number five for me?
so I don't know how much long, how much further this is from that uh, the mural you did, but you definitely see like an elevation in, in this in this painting, I think, and a lot of the paintings moving forward. Um, and a lot, I don't know, it seems to also you in this painting in particular, you pick something that's pulling your eye and moving it up, almost making the telephone pole as a, you know, an individual. Right, right. I think, uh, I think these, these pieces in particular take maybe a more figurative role versus a landscape role um, in the painting. And this one, I think, has, this was a lot lo later after that. This was, I think, two and a half years after that mural, maybe three years after that mural. Um, so a lot of technical applications stuff changed over those, that time frame, and just trying to find different, different ways to make it look better and more unique and a little bit more painterly. So, yeah, this one definitely had a lot of a lot of growth in comparison to the other the other piece that's definitely um danny can you pull up slide number three please now what can you tell me about this piece justin Yeah, so this piece, uh, this piece was a really interesting one. This was a reference from a place that was around the corner from my mother's house. And the they were replacing the damaged roof with a brand new full size roof, I guess. Um, but they were, that's a reference from from that. And that was in my first solo show. So that piece in particular was was interesting. I think I think growing up like around, you know, the, the certain people that I did and other kids and all that, it, it was interesting to see the, the changes in life that kind of occurred from back then until, until when I did that piece. And I think that new roof kind of symbolized a lot of things personally for me when I was creating that and just in my own personal life so that was that was a real interesting interesting one and that was at my my solo show at the morian art center as well danny can you pull up slide number seven for me yep i have another one yeah. Really, really focused on the telephone pole here. Yeah, and you definitely see like a, a, a ton of like history, history marks where you didn't totally get away from the other marks that you were doing with the power lines. Does that indicate something in particular? Not necessarily. I, I didn't have any necessarily symbolism behind that aspect of this painting. I think here I was trying to trying to just play with different applications of the paint and seeing how many more layers I could add to it. I was trying to overlay different references here um, in my initial mock-up process of just doing it in Photoshop. And in the in the mock-up, I saw how those those certain lines were further back and it was just an accident that I did in Photoshop. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I can, you know, physically make the painting look like that. And so that's that's how that actually came about. In a lot of your process, do you take it into Photoshop a lot of times before you actually, you know, take it to canvas or take it to a wall? Yeah, all of it, all of it is in Photoshop first. I work with all my own references. Um, so I try to just always take pictures of my daily routines and what I'm doing and where I'm going. And then at times I'll sit there and I'll be in Photoshop and just start to slightly overlay images, take some stuff away, see what kind of compositions I can make. And then from there, try to 
physically physically make that piece. Now, have you ever thought about doing um, like digital work since you spend already you're already spending time in Photoshop? Have you thought about putting like digital work together in that kind of way? Yeah, I I haven't really I haven't really dibble, dabbled with a lot of digital stuff. I took a digital class in high school, so I did I did a few Photoshop projects then, but as far as my own personal work, I've never actually done a, a final piece per se in a digital format. Um, it's always just kind of a vessel to make uh, a piece that um, is tangible, I guess, in that sense. Right. And then I, well, I guess since you're bringing up the idea of like, we're talking about computers and tangible, like, how do you feel about the NFTs? The NFTs are interesting. I, I don't, I'm not well, Burst in in all of the the logistics of NFTs and how they're made and sold. I think it's very interesting to see where all of that cryptocurrency and the NFTs and all that, the direction all that stuff's going. It is interesting to hear all the money people have been making making F NFTs as well. There's Absolutely. some big big payouts there, what I've seen. So it's interesting. Oh yeah, no, I think like I don't know if it's. A I mean, some of the numbers they're throwing around that people are paying for these, you know, NFTs are just absolutely yeah. ridiculous, you know? Yeah, um, very interesting. Yeah, I definitely feel like it, uh, you know, but it allows, I think, the collector to collect maybe more if they don't have the actual storage space for work, you know what I mean? That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't think about it that way. I, you know what, I really just thought about it right now, just the idea that, you know, right. some collectors, yeah, like, I mean, that whole conversation of, well, maybe that's part of the, you know, the appeal to it that I can actually collect, you know, more artwork and then actually be able to put it on a, you know, digital representation where I have the paintings, you know, that I own that are digital continuously play on, you know, a monitor that now is, you know, like the canvas, you know? Right. Right. Um, Danny, can you pull up slide number eight for me? No, we got numbers, man. What's up with the numbers? Yeah, yeah that uh, <laughs> this piece in particular was a really fun one to do. Um, this was with the laundry project. So the project where they go to different laundry mats and they do either a free day or a free weekend where everybody can come and get their, their laundry washed for free. And, and they do murals alongside of that to just kind of help beautify the area and stuff like that. So this piece was my first time with the laundry project and it was a very fun one to do. You know, it, being in around a community, people that are just so grateful to see, you know, you putting something up like that in the community and the responses of everyone being very excited just to see what it's looking like and turning out to be. But this was the first piece that I started introducing some more design elements too. So those were those numbers are kind of, that's where those numbers first started from. Uh, I wanted to kind of try to find a direction where I could add more layers and design elements to my piece that, so it isn't just necessarily just a landscape or a telephone pole. Maybe there's a little bit more context to what the telephone pole is. Okay. And then even like, I don't know, like, so it's, it definitely seems to have taken that really very painterly feel to, like you said, a very graphic, you know, almost, you know, a very just graphic representation of, you know, imagery. And, um, what do you think influenced you in that direction? Huh, I think, honestly, I started working with Pep Rally in Tampa, um, and it's a great company, and we do a, a lot of murals are around Tampa and we've started to do stuff in Texas and DC we've had some projects out there and working with them and seeing how much all of their designs change in the different elements they add in there it, it really influenced me to to try to develop what I do a little bit more and try to develop my overall designs and, and what I get out of my final piece uh, I I feel like I got stagnant with just trying to take a photo, paint the photo, and that's it. 
I wanted to see what I could do a little bit more creatively to add, add some more context to the piece. So the numbers in this piece are actually just a part of the address of the building. The building is one one or one four nine nine, and then the rest of the address, which I don't remember. Right, so it's taking something that you know, something that's a reference to an area of, I guess, the imagery then, and just to give a reference point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The you know, in other pieces, I've done grid coordinates and whatnot as well to to further that idea, but it is all based on where the reference photo is taken. So that was a telephone pole that was on the corner of the other side of the block and the numbers there are of the building. Um, so that's how those two things correlate. And the design here is what I was striving for was to you know, kind of blend the two of solid color design and a more blended painting in a sense. Yeah, so how was it received by, um, by the people that actually use the laundromat? Did you run into any of them? Yeah, I was there for three days painting it. And um, it was very fun. You know, everyone loved it. Everyone, I don't think anybody recognized that it was that specific telephone pole. I mean, they tend to look pretty similar, but, <laughs> you know, um, it was, everyone was just very grateful about it. And it was interesting to see people's reaction of a telephone pole being painted. Uh, it was, some people were shocked by it. Some people were a little like a uh, telephone pole, um, but ultimately people, People loved it over there and it was very fun. That was a very fun project that I did. It's an awesome piece, man. Thank you. Um, Danny, can you pull up slide number 15 for me? Definitely, I can see the you can see the coordinates and um, same kind of graphic nature. Now, this one come before the uh, the mural that you did um, on the laundromat. I believe, so. I, I, huh? believe I believe this one did come before. Um, I don't think I was finished with this painting before I did the laundromat. Uh, they were kind of went it simultaneously, um, but you, this piece is what I was referencing when I talked about the, the grid coordinates being of the location of the reference photo. So that's the connection with this one as well. Um, that photograph was at an Airbnb when I was doing the other mural at the <laughs> elementary school and I ended up painting it, you know, um, like two years after that. So yeah. So, so what you're saying is basically every day you get more and more stock files of references that you can just pull back on at any moment. Yeah, they, they, come, they come pretty frequently throughout the day. So, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this one is definitely like, a lot of your stuff is very complex and a lot of uh, the, the idea of movement that you get within a composition. Um, is it just fluid when you build a composition or is it, you know, kind of formulaic? Um, I wouldn't say it's formulaic. I don't have like a specific set of rules that I'll follow. Um, I try to, there are certain things that I repeat a lot. You know, this crop circle image is something I've been repeating a lot lately, or if I'm doing a, a full circle, but not doing um, any hard angles as a bounding box for, for the piece itself. The grid coordinates are another aspect that stays pretty, pretty frequent throughout all the work now, but I think it's more or less just the details of some stuff that I think people pass by every day. You know, same thing with this fence. You know, I thought it was a very interesting fence. I'd like the patina on it. I like the plants that were growing around it. And so i sat there and I took, a, you know, some photos for like 10 minutes and then I forgot about it, you know, and I, and I stay going through, you know, those albums of photos that I have on my phone or on my computer and then I'll pull from all of those. So 
you know, in this piece particularly, like there wasn't the palm tree behind the big fence there. So I, I added that in there. I added the trees on the left-hand side, just from other reference photos. Uh, so that's sort of how I'll build compositions in Photoshop. Almost like you would if you were using, you know, a piece of paper with a collage. Exactly. Yeah. If I could just physically cut them out, you know, very fast with an exacto blade, I would be doing that. <laughs> yeah, a computer makes it a little bit faster. Yeah, um, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now you've been, like you said, you work for a mural company over in Tampa. Um, how, how do you feel about when you have people who reach out to you and you know, the difference between doing something for exposure, doing something for a good cause and doing something monetarily. Like, how do you distinguish whether you're gonna do, which one you're gonna do if the project arrives? Um, I think mainly it's just about being excited about it for me. You know, um, working with Pep Rally, I don't, I don't have to take any, job that's given to me per se you know like that's um that comes my way just from someone that wants me to do something so I, I i'm able to sort of feel those a little bit differently because i'm working with pep rally so any kind of stuff that i'm doing in my own in my own personal work tends to be only that um i i don't necessarily do a lot of commercial stuff um you know, so that's mainly all of my work outside of Pep Rally is strictly my work. So it gives you that idea of, you know, being able to be selective on what represents you versus, you know, having to, you know, adhere to it what a me, client, it gives, yeah. It gives me the financial ease to, to be able to just focus on my own personal work when I'm, when I'm in the studio doing that. Yeah. Does it do you feel not that to, gives you not to, not to you know support my um personal work in the studio, you know? Right. So I do you feel because I definitely feel it gives you a little more like your work feels extremely honest and personal. You know, it's it doesn't seem to be influenced by, you know, by other people who, you know, make you maybe ask you to come outside of your box that you do, you know, just to be able to pay bills, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think the work it, itself, uh, you know, like I said, it allows me to just do what I want. I don't have to worry about making a painting that someone's really, really going to love and going to want to buy that week because I need to pay my rent. I can just focus on, you know, making the painting that I personally want to make. Absolutely. Um, Danny, can you pull up slide number 14 for me, please? Now, for me me personally, this is probably uh, the most I've been excited about your work in a long time. And yeah. it's it just it's it, it's a nice little it's a bump in growth. So let's just yeah. let's start. Let's start with what inspired you to create something like this so i i saw it in i saw something in someone's personal collection and it was a very large concrete piece and at first i was like how did they how are they hanging a whole concrete slab on their wall and from there i figured out the process of how to create that piece um and, and to create that slab of concrete there so that was my initial my initial part was like i said going back the process wanting to figure out how someone achieved a certain thing and seeing if i could could figure it out on my own and the concrete was a very fun break in not doing anything with spray paint or acrylic or a canvas it was a totally new material that was a very big learning curve and I had no idea how to do it. There was a lot of trial and error in the sense of 
figuring out the concrete's going to stick. Is it going to fall off? What do I need to add underneath of it? Um, if there's any kind of other additives to the mix that I need to use. So that was a very fun initial start to this piece here. Yeah, and I mean, the uh, the colors are like, like the, you know, the monochromatic grayscale is just so vibrant on this compared to the canvases, you know, and yeah. Yeah. Now, is there a different kind of application process you used or is it the same application process? It's the same application process, you know, interestingly enough. Um, I, I think the, the concrete gives a lot of warm tone underneath of it in comparison to maybe, a, you know, a canvas that's just, a, you know, a stark white prime. But, you know, it's interesting to see all the, the warm little textures and colors that are all in that concrete and then having this dark, bold, you know, monochromatic black and white color scheme on top. It's interesting to see those two kind of collide because I haven't I haven't done that, you know, in the sense even when we paint walls, you know, we prime the walls a solid color instead of leaving those subtleties in the concrete or the the weathered paint. Well, absolutely. And then I also like the the um, the composition and of how it's a rec it's a square with a circle and then a rectangle and the yeah. idea that you don't ever paint like really rectangles anymore. <laughs> um, but the idea of it's capturing this multiple yeah. layers of yeah. imagery, you know? Right. right. So where, where yeah, do you feel like... Was... Go ahead. No, what were you about to say? I'm sorry. No, I, I was going to say, where do, you, where do you feel like this is... Do you feel like you're going to do more of these? Definitely. Yeah. I have a lot of different ones right now that I'm working on that I just haven't shared any pictures with um, or shared any pictures of, but yeah, I'm definitely going more towards down this rabbit hole right now, trying to see how far I can push it and, you know, different stuff like that. Yeah. Cause it definitely brings on like a sculptural, you know, um, element to it. It's almost like you, you can almost see it going in so many different directions, you know, from, from just this point on its own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's, um, trying to figure out how far I can push it, how big I can make them. This piece here is I think two feet by two feet, maybe a little bit under. Um, and the weight of this one is pretty, pretty light. It's not, not substantially heavy. It's just hangs in the wall with, two screws with an anchor in each screw. Um, but I just recently built uh, a three foot by four foot one and that, that one's pretty heavy. So I'm trying to figure out how I can, you know, mitigate some weight and make it a little bit more feasible for people to hang inside their homes without an entire, you know, project of hanging it. Is that its own hanging system that comes when you buy the painting? Right, right, and an installation team and all that. So, <laughs> awesome. but yeah, I'm excited to keep pushing the concrete stuff. I am. It, I think it's a fun new direction for me, and it and it got me excited about figuring out a new process. You know, I, I figured out how to paint telephone poles, um, and I I wanted to see what what else I could change about the work other than that. And and I think this was a very fun step in the right direction for that. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and you always, you're constantly talking about process, constantly talking about process. Is it, um, is the finished piece more important than the process or the process more important than the finished piece? I think it's it's interesting, right? I get I get two different things out of it. So I think the process is what I creatively really enjoy. Um, the finished piece is great because then you get the feedback. You know, it, it boosts your confidence of wanting to create more. You you know, you have friends that you can have honest conversations with. I mean, me and you have had countless honest conversations about artwork and. You know, there's been times where <clears throat> you've said a lot of things about a piece and I was like, 
man, he is, he is right. I don't, I can't disagree with him there. And, and you make, you make yourself think about it differently. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what's interesting when you have the final product, you're able to get that feedback from, you know, peers and in, in your own circle. And then the, you know, the, the worldwide people that see it, you know, you, you try to, you get that feedback from them, the love, and that kind of gives you the, the push to keep making more stuff. Absolutely. It's, it's like the finishing, it's like to the process. If you don't have the finished product, you can't continue the process, you know? Um, right. Right. And I think like, how important do you feel it is for other artists to be, you know, to talk with other artists and like have those critique moments? I think it's super important. Um, I think it's very important to, to not take offense from your peers when they're trying to give you critiques, you know, and, and to really take it to a creative side and see what you can do with that feedback. Um, and there's also times where I think you are supposed to make your decision of, nope, I'm going to leave it that way. I'm trying to do it that way. And you have that full right. But I, I think finding that balance as an artist is the most important thing when having conversations with your peers about the artwork you're creating is the, the acceptance of other people's opinions and ideas, but the own, your own self like courage and, and confidence to be able to still stick to what you want to do. You know, you, you don't want to let an entire group of people dictate what you're painting at the end of the day too, you know? So it's just finding that balance. All right. Well, I, I guess before we bring uh, Danny back on, I've got one question for you. What piece of advice would you give any up and coming artist? Another piece of advice would I give to up and coming I think the biggest thing is just just keep going. Don't let anything discourage you. Um, don't get caught up running in the same circle you know chasing your own tail trying to worry about things that don't matter you know what what's important is creating the artwork and and trying to just keep pushing yourself and seeing what avenues you can do and at the end of the day you know you're you got to be wanting to do it for yourself so always keeping close to that staying staying close to wanting to um always keep it you know, true to yourself um, and, and just keep going. Don't let anything get in your way. Keep pushing, keep creating the artwork. If you can't do it, figure out a way to do it, you know, and, you know, it's just, you, you can do it, you know, and you can do anything you want to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. Hey, Danny, you there? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> I've been <laughs> hiding in the background this whole time. Uh, Thanks a lot, guys. That was a fascinating conversation. And that was a perfect question to end with for, for this episode and, and for this first season of Friend of a Friend. Um, really, really fascinating to be able to go through all that work and to learn, uh, learn more about it. So thanks a lot, uh, Reed and Justin. Really appreciate uh, you guys talking, Thank getting you. to know uh, both of you a bit more and, and the work and the thoughts behind it is uh, really fascinating, both the murals and the paintings too. Very cool to see the, the new direction heading into. Uh, it was cool to see everybody on Facebook uh, react to this last painting that we um, that we went over, which was really cool too. Um, so again, with that, I'd, I'd like to thank you, uh, Reed, uh, for hosting, being last month's guest too, uh, Justin for joining us uh, as our guest um, for closing out this season.